Hi, I'm Dr. Jason J. Campbell, and I want to thank you for taking the time to watch my videos. Um, this video is actually a response to a question that I got last night on Facebook. Uh, the question had to do with the, the conceptualization of an emerging hegemon, and how can we talk about hegemony and the emergence of hegemony, but not only how can we talk about hegemony and the emergence of hegemony, but how can we talk about um, maintaining hegemonized power once it's been established. So, um, again, I got this question last night, and today I gathered some books together, put some materials together, spent about uh, two, three hours, nothing significant, uh, and I wrote seven pages on exactly that concept. So, what I would recommend that you do now is I'm going to hyperlink a PDF to the video. Click the link. Um, hyperlinked in the video, download a PDF, and follow along, because I'm going to be reading the content. And j just keep in mind that, you know, I'm not doing this for my job function. This doesn't have to do with anything that I need to do as a professor. Um, typically, instructors would take this idea and seek to publish it in a peer-reviewed journal, but you already know how I feel about that, because I've discussed that in other lectures. It's important that I get the information out to the community. And, you know, it's one thing, as I said before, it's one thing to say that you're doing something. It's another thing to actually do it. So instead of rather just giving the, res the, the response in a blurb on Facebook, I decided to, hey, why not overdo it and, um, you know, do a little bit of research, compile some notes, um, write, a, write a small article, and, you know, put it out there to be critiqued. Um, so as far as punctuation, grammar, all that other stuff, I'm not really interested in that. This is more the concept. This is more to start social discussion. I think the ideas that I discuss in here are pretty unique in a sense. And it's just to contribute yet again another contribution to um, the globe and free education. So with that, again, if you haven't done so yet, pause the video now. I'm assuming you paused it. Print the... Print the... Um, print the article and follow along. We'll just read it. Again, I wrote this uh, today, which is Monday, I don't know what today is, the 25th or something like that, of July. So, uh, the title is Orthodoxy, Heterodoxy, and Identity Reformation Through Political Recognition. All right, so we're going to talk about the role of political recognition, and uh, it was written by me. And it's just a little something I put together. You know, this is the product of maybe two hours worth of work. All right, so here's a quick disclaimer. The analysis here in is presented for the purpose of discourse. Right? The paper was specifically written as a catalyst for discussion throughout cyberspace. That's the whole reason I wrote it. Um, it addresses a Facebook private message concerning the emergence of the hegemon. So I didn't want to put the person's um, name out there because he or she might not want the world to know that he or she asked me this question. But this is specifically a video response. But not only a video response, an article coupled with a video response to your question, which was like maybe two sentences. <laughs> um, instead of simply writing a little blurb, I decided to define the necessary mechanisms needed to conceptualize its formation. Um, this paper then is a product of my conceptualization. So let's begin again. This is just a taste, right? Oh, and the reason, like, to give you a, a something, an analogy that you can understand, I'm a member of Gen X hip hop community, and in the hip hop world they have a mixtape release before the actual album drops. So you can think of this as like my mixtapes, right? This is a taste of what I do when I think for the book release in September, or October actually, on Genocidal Intent, and then the subsequent book release next year, uh, June, like next year this time, on stuff that I can't even disclose yet. So this is just a taste, right? This is That's all that is, it's just a taste. Okay, so abstract. So I'm assuming you have it, and we'll follow along. Because all I'm going to do is read it. I'm, I'll, I'll stop at points to make, make commentary as needed. So, in a theoretical analysis of the emergent properties of political power, that is, those necessary and sufficient conditions that must be met in order to identify a power structure as political power, it is of the utmost importance that one acknowledge the inherent imbalances within and throughout a diversity of instantiations of power. For those instantiations that exhibit disproportionate distributions of power, for example, and namely, namely, 
socially demarcated class-based identities, identities that have undeniably been constructed with the forethought of perpetuating these disproportionate distributions of power within identity, one must acknowledge the need and absolute requirements to battle for power. What the hell does that mean? For those of you that aren't familiar with the very technical jargon presented here, um, social strata, social demarcation, separates and identifies upper, middle, lower class. Individual people occupy those social positions, upper class person, middle class person, lower class person. These identifications in terms of personhood are associated with their quote-unquote class-based identification. And you can, you can imagine the benefits and the disadvantages of being um, labeled as upper class and, and lower class um, respectively. So, the battle then emerges between those currently in control of political power and those marginalized populations desperately seeking the necessary means of mobilizing heterodox communities to usurp the power of the existing hegemon. The battle is personalized by attempting to reconstruct personal identity independent to the oppressive forces of existing political power. Right? This is sort of a free area. Political power, however, as the instantiated hegemon, must recognize the tendency for marginalized populations to ceaselessly challenge the existing status quo, and in preservation of that power alone, make accommodations for such populations. I'm going to explain the significance of this later. Right? There is always going to be members within marginalized communities asking for more, demanding more, mobilizing to get more, and it is to the benefit of the existing hegemon to recognize and acknowledge those demands and then, you know, best meet those demands or not meet those demands um, based on based on any number of factors, which I'm not going to get into here because this is just for cyberspace. The interrelation then between social demarcation and identity formation is not exclusive to the population. The hegemon um, emerges and potentially re-emerges like a phoenix, like re-emergence, re-identification of the hegemon. The hegemon transforms the way in which it is identified both internally and internationally, domestically and internationally, if it is able to, one, identify those displaced communities within marginalized populations with the clearest message articulated through public opinion. Right? Public opinion becomes the vehicle with which I'm doing an advanced political theories lecture series, and the idea is public opinion where there is a conformity between public opinion and, and political will, there is a uh, homogenous directive towards some goal. Right? Both the public and the um, existing political will is directed towards the same end. Right? That's the idea. Two, where this community has effectively mobilized the public based on their articulated message, right? so not only do you have to do that, but you also have to mobilize the community who are making the demands of the political, has to mobilize the population. It's not just that you say, hey, we want, we want, we want, but it's, hey, we want, we want, we want, and we've mobilized, right? Think of the Montgomery bus boycotts. If it were simply just that Rosa Parks refused to get up and she won as an individual made a refusal, we wouldn't, we wouldn't know of her. The reason why we know of her, the reason why she has historical relevance is because her act of defiance mobilized the population. It's insofar as that population is mobilized, that political power now takes account of the marginalized population, right? So demands without mobilization is basically ridiculous, right? You're wasting your time. Um, and three, cultivated empathy for its message, specifically rather than the individual within the community, right? It isn't so much about parks as it is about a recognition of fairness that black people get to sit on the bus anywhere they want. Um, this is sort of a trite example, but the idea is there needs to be an empathic message that is inherent to the demands, that is inherent to the demands of any marginalized community if there is to be any recognition from the existing hegemon. That's my argument, right? So the potential threat, quote-unquote, to existing political power throughout history has been the growing resistance to use power without the consideration of members from those marginalized communities. Right? You think of any revolution, French Revolution, United States against Britain, whatever, what have you, there is an inability of the existing hegemon to recognize marginalized communities and 
insofar as there's an inability to recognize political power wasn't used, wasn't mobilized, wasn't activated to help those communities or to acknowledge those communities, right? So they were left, in a sense, to fend for themselves. Conceptually, then, there's no logical contradiction, right, in the possibility of perpetually deferring transformation and, most importantly, the transference of political power if the existing hegemon recognizes its weakening effect with an A, affect, influence, and reforms its identity to accommodate such populations. What in the hell does that mean? That means where existing power has already been entrenched, has already been established, it, as the existing hegemon, needs to recognize the growing demands from a diversity of marginalized populations. And insofar as it makes this recognition, it should be motivated to act in accordance with the effectiveness of these marginalized populations to mobilize their respective communities. Those marginalized populations that are best equipped to mobilize their respective communities are putting themselves inherently in a better position to have their demands met than those populations, those marginalized communities, where demands are being sort of put on the table, so to speak, but there hasn't been any corresponding social mobilization. So, next, understanding the ideological intent relationship. The political incorporation and appropriation of ideological constructs since Marx has resulted in innumerable attempts to reshape and redefine the nature of political rule. How this rule manifests is here irrelevant. I don't really care about that. Also irrelevant and wholly subsumed by an understanding of political identity is the attempt to artificially demarcate forms of governance. Obviously, variations in governance, not government, is by definition a subset of political identity. Part of the identity of the political is the way in which the political manifests its governance. So rather than talking about a subset of political identity, that is governance, let's just talk about political identity. Thus, rather than rehashing the now antiquated differences between socialism and democracy, egalitarianism and anarchy, liberalism and theocracy, I have chosen to conceptualize the relationship between the political ideology, X, what have you, and its role in both nationalism, if it exists, if nationalism occurs, in its very sort of articulated sense, and I wrote about this in my dissertation, so if you want to know more about that, just read my dissertation, and national identity proper. So, pertaining to the role of ideology, Fawn 2004 writes the following, quote, Official ideology established rules and procedures for the totality of human existence. The totality of human existence is covered under ideological prescriptions, which entail rules and procedures. It affected every shaped, it affected, even shaped every aspect of life. That the ideology itself might have been reshaped shows its importance as the starting point and justification for everything. So the ability for the ideology to be reshaped, right? The malleability, the flexibility, the, the transformation of one ideology into something slightly different shows that it puts itself, in a sense, anthropomorphifies, in a sense, to justify basically everything because the ideology isn't dogmatic, it's flexible. It lends itself to logic and such. The complete and pervasive effect of ideological systems to control and establish rule of social conduct derive its effectiveness from the political and legal mechanisms to enforce social conformity through law, right? Conformity through law. And it's like, duh. Since ideologies potentially serve as, quote, the justification for everything, and since quite obviously laws need to justify punishment, for example, specifically um, to the population, any attempt to justify legal action itself assumes a community affected by such action. Like, to talk about, in any sense, legal and judicial systems means that those systems take place within the context of the social. Judicial and legal systems don't take place in a vacuum. Right? The systems themselves are constructed as regulatory mechanisms for sort of controlling, in a sense, and, and, and mitigating conflict, if you will, within the social. It's not a bad thing, which I'm going to say in a second, right? So the judicial system functions as a conforming and regulatory mechanism of political power directed toward the social, which is in no sense an indictment of the legal system. Its function is precisely to maintain um, normality, 
and you know we could we could qualify that given more time but this is for YouTube and I wrote this specifically and I'm presenting this specifically just for discussion um, through the system though the system affects communities it undeniably affects individuals within those communities so it's one thing to talk about on a very superficial level it's not superficial but on a very superficial level the context based based functioning of judicial and legal systems in terms of its corresponding social community relationship. But the recognition is that communities are comprised themselves of individuals. Thus you just do the hypothetical syllogism and you recognize that the judicial and legal systems actually are mechanisms of regulating um, normality, quote unquote, of individual human bodies. Those individuals are said to belong to their respective social classes and since, next page, we have already established through, though briefly due to the length of this paper, the disproportionate distribution of power within those classes, it would certainly be possible that the implementation of political power within communities also, um, are, uh, also, differ. also differ. What does that mean? It means we have a high class, low class, middle class. We have the high class individual, the middle class individual, the low class individual, sort of hypothetically speaking, unfortunately in a very real sense. And the idea is that the judicial system applies to individuals, but it applies to individuals within the stratified social demarcation, class-based demarcation in a, in a sort of Marxist, Marxist sense. Thus, we have to recognize the potential, I'm not saying that it is the case, but the potential for judicial and legal appropriation of power, political power, to itself be influenced by the socially demarcated strata, right? So that someone at the upper class might get more advantage, more justice than someone in the lower class, right? That's sort of the argument. Whether it's true or not isn't the point. The idea is that there's a potential for that to occur, that disproportionate, um, that disproportionality to occur. And you just think about the distinctions between cocaine and crack laws as just one example, right? If the perception of this apparatus, uh, sorry, if the perception of this apparent difference is socially constructed as favoring one group and exploiting the other, favoring the upper class, exploiting the other, or it can be anything, it doesn't have to just be class-based, then it is the perception that threatens the potential power of the existing hegemon, right? If I think that it's because of this recognition that they're getting benefits that I'm not, then of course I'm upset that they're getting benefits that I'm not, but the way in which I internalize the way in which I think about this distinction is itself contingent on the perception, right? The perception is, well, everybody should get the same amount. It should be fair across the board. What have, what have you, it can be anything. But the idea is that perception is what threatens the existing hegemon, not the individual body, not yet, because we haven't even approached mobilization, right? Prior to population mobilization, obviously, would be sort of a uniformity in perception. So. If political power wants to stay in power, it has to recognize the diversity of perception. And I immediately know now that, you know, people are going to be upset with the fact that this is not traditionally what liberal academics do. Liberal, liberal academics don't traditionally, or basically in any case, defend the existing um, power structure. Um, I, I, am, I am defending, not necessarily defending, but talking about the conditions with which the existing hegemon defends itself. Right? It's, it's not about the United States, it's not about Britain, it's not about, you know, India. It's about an existing hegemon as such, right? So there is a corresponding narrative that needs to be had. So if the perception of this apparent um, difference in socially, is socially constructed as favoring one group and exploiting another, then it is the perception that threatens the political power of the existing hegemon. To mitigate the potential for this perception to become realized, as mobilized opposition to the existing hegemon, it is of the utmost importance that the hegemon reconstruct the means with which the perception is understood. The perception is a threat to the hegemon. Since it's a threat to the hegemon, if the hegemon wants to stay in power, it needs to influence the perception. Thus, it is undeniable, it is undeniably an epistemological battle, quote unquote, to deter those potential participants in a mobilized opposition from seeking to usurp, from seeking to usurp the power of the existing hegemon by transforming how they understand the perception, right? It's perception reconstruction as a means of mitigating the loss of political power.
to be technical. The opportunities to establish political identity, hegem um, the, uh, this is a quote, quote, the opportunities to establish political identity, hegemony grow to, um, the more the decision rights of segment states and power segment state leaders to cultivate a cadre of national cultural leaders who elaborate the segment state project to mobilize resources in the campaign that propagates this project, the project being hegemony, the reinforcement of hegemony, and to deny alternative elites access to these resources, right? So three parts, three part analysis, existing hegemon, competing hegemon, um, potentially mobilized population, existing hegemon denying potential threat to he the, uh, another elite, another hegemon from usurping its power by denying it resource accessibility while simultaneously recognizing marginalized communities trying to satisfy the demands of those marginalized communities so that there isn't a mobilized concerted effort to usurp the power. Right? A lot of, a lot of problems that an existing hegemon has. Quite obviously, within the United States now specifically, we, not, we are not analyzing segment states and, um, and the citation above cannot directly apply to our quote-unquote representational democracy. Nonetheless, the insight pertains to the means, not the institution that empowers leaders. That's from the quote. The mechanisms of political power that empower those without power will arguably reinforce hegemony by the ability to mobilize resources and deny competitors access to those resources. Thus, where there may have been ill feelings against the existing hegemon, which could have undermined political power, the hegemon reinforces its power and recognizes marginalized communities by empowering members of those communities for the sole purpose of maintaining preserving, and preserving its existing power. I recognize that my power is being threatened by demands from marginalized populations. If it's the case that I have within my sort of in, 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 the, in the purview of my resources the ability to satisfy the demands via sort of you know um, socio-political negotiations what have you the demands of those marginalized communities then insofar as those those demands are met there's no desire then to usurp the power of the political so that the political maintains its current power hegemony is hegemony is and the marginalized population is satisfied that their demands have been met and no longer seek power. Thus, the means of political will, direct, um, will is directed toward the preservation of power and the quote-unquote ethics of its implementation become a condition of its functioning. It's very important. Thus, I categorically deny all claims that suggest political power can only manifest its power ethically if it assumes some altruistic stance, I absolutely, categorically, unequivocally go on the record as denying wholeheartedly all claims, all epistemological, all ethical claims that make the totalizing assumption that the only way for political will to manifest ethically is if it's manifesting for some altruistic state of affairs. I deny that. My point is that you can be completely, it's not necessarily Hobbesian, but you can be completely self-motivated for nothing other than the preservation of political power, and still act ethically, right? That's the claim. So my claim is that you can still be motivated by complete preservation of power and still have ethical action in the world. That's my stance. It is not a contradiction to both assert political will as motivated by the preservation of existing power and an ethical governance. If some suggest that this is, that it is a logical contradiction, then the burden of proof is theirs to bear. Where the hegemon recognizes its growing vulnerability because of a previous failure to recognize marginalized populations and acknowledges this oversight and furthermore implements mechanisms to recognize and empower those otherwise dislocated communities, hegemony creates the possibility for members of the heterodox, meaning the marginalized community, to express their voice. Right? Insofar as you have demands, there has to be the condition for which your demands can be met. If, for example, just to ghetto style it real quick, you're in another room and you're asking me for demands as a student, and I don't, I'm not in that room, I can never hear what your demands are. Insofar as the, the hegemon um, is in a position to satisfy the demands, 
it's not going to satisfy every single demand. It's ridiculous to think that hegemony of any kind is going to satisfy every single demand from every single marginalized population. No. There is a sense in which those demands which are the most relevant, quote-unquote, are those demands which have a corresponding social mobilization behind them. Demands prima facie are completely insignificant. Demands, in terms of just demands as demands, mean absolutely nothing without a corresponding social mobilization. Now, I recognize sort of my stance is a bit harsh. It's extremely harsh. But I want to take the stance openly and publicly, right? Since moreover, voice is inextricably bound to identity in terms of, you know, voice and intersectionality of identity and identity politics and blah, 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 it is absolutely essential to understand that the empowerment of leaders within leaders from the quote uh, before, leaders within these marginalized communities is a validation of their identity. Since the recognition from hegemony creates the voice, the condition for voices to be expressed, and since voices are associated via, you know, politics of identity with identity, then the recognition of the community is a condition for a recognition of identity. It's a recognition of the individual, not just the community. It is more than simple past, um, uh, placation, right? This is not placation. So the, the opponent might say, well, Jason, this is just placation um, by hegemony to the individual, and I'm denying that as well. It is a means of guaranteeing continued power where there could have otherwise existed a unified and mobilized opposition to that power. The motive, which I personally view as completely irrelevant, and I know that, you know, this is less formal, but I don't, why is the sovereign, why is hegemonized power um, interested? I don't care about why. Who cares why they're interested or why they're not? The point is, they will be interested if conditions have been satisfied. What are those conditions? Social mobilization, empathy, demands, localized voice, blah, 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 some of these conditions. Um, the motive, which I personally view as completely irrelevant, has been from the onset of this analysis motivated by the preservation of existing power, and yet it empowers otherwise marginalized leaders. So despite the fact that the motive is sheer sort of self-reflection, self-referential, maintaining power, it empowers that self-referential self desire to institutionalize the existing power can empower others for the better. Right? It doesn't have to always regress into, um, as Galton might say, um, structural violence. It's not to deny that structural violence is an outcome of this, but it's not to say that it always manifests in some bad. It can, and it often does, manifest in empowering individuals within the community. I mean, to deny that, I would need to hear the counterexample, right? To say that that is categorically an, an impossibility seems too, too extreme of a stance. And I hope I have enough time on my, uh, I should have been keeping track of my time. I think it was, so, um, so the motive, blah, 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 I said that. So, um, to still demand that political will conform to some antiquated and utopist altruism, despite the very real empowerment of individuals within marginalized communities, is to undermine the recognition of their identities. Right? It is to undermine, to say that, oh no, it doesn't count, right? When political power, when hegemony recognizes and acknowledges and, and acknowledges an individual leader within a community, so the acknowledgement of Martin Luther King, the acknowledgement of Mahatma Gandhi, the acknowledgement of, of uh, Malcolm X, the acknowledgement of whoever, right? When hegemony recognizes and acknowledges a community a leader, then if you say that the only reason that hegemony did that was through an act of placation, you fail, you disempower the individual who has been empowered. Right? And, and so on like a street sense, it's like, oh, of course, uh, every time you see MLK, uh, MLK Street, it's in the ghetto. You're disempowering the fact that Martin Luther King, Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, has street names throughout all the United States of America which in itself is meaningless, but you get the idea, right? The idea is to say, oh, well, it's just an act of placation, it's just an act of pacification, is to disempower the fact that he, as an individual, has attained, as an individual, recognition from the hegemon. Right? That's, that, that's, that's, I, I, I think that's just a really bad stance. 
right? And then to make the further claim that any time this structure is motivated as hegemony to protect its interests, that it necessarily has to manifest. And I'm not saying that Galton says this, right? But many people say that, well, you know, insofar as hegemony is concerned, the very attempt to institutionalize safeguards which protect existing power necessitate structural violence. I'm, I deny that categorically. It doesn't necessitate. It is a consequence. Structural violence is absolutely a consequence. But the, uh, the attempt, I would say to be technical, um, structural violence is a necessary, uh, not structural violence, the self-referential attempts to safeguard and protect political power serves as a necessary, though not sufficient condition for structural violence, because it's not enough to say that that's just that alone leads to structural violence. There are many other factors, and Galton talks about this himself, cultural and such. Similarly, I would say that this attempt by the existing hegemon to protect its power um, in no sense benefits the community or individuals in the community. That too is ridiculous. Right? So the idea is, you know, I, I just, you know, as a young, new, up and coming um, scholar, just want to just want to put it on record for those who are coming after me um, that, you know, the, the tables are going to turn in this sort of, you know, bandwagon hopping where everybody's going to say that anywhere we see hegemonized power, um, and even the term hegemonized power is itself pejorative, anytime we see political power in any sense, it's always bad and we always have to revolt against that. That's ridiculous. That's my claim, right? And I'm going to go on the record as saying that that's my claim because I think we have to be far more meticulous in the ways in which we talk about revolution, in the ways that we talk about social liberation. You can have social liberation. It is legitimate. There are instances when governments should be overthrown. There are instances in which hegemonized power is corrupt. But to say that hegemonized power as such, prima facie, is always corrupt, is always um, institutionally the base is, uh, is it really isn't even a position I, I don't I don't think right so um, thus the relation between the governing ideology and the respective identities of individuals of individuals as of individuals within marginalized communities serves as a necessary condition for identity reformation of the political right so that what that means is the political, can transform its political identity by addressing the needs of communities it otherwise never did. The United States of America changed the way in which it identified itself and others, external sources, domestic sources, identified what it meant to be the United States of America once the United States of America recognized and gave um, women and blacks the right to vote. Right? It wasn't the same political identity. Political identity transformed. There is a sense in which, then, political identity and its transformation is a good thing. It's a means of stabilizing political power, of ensuring political power, but not in some sense of, oh, we just have to protect political power. No, if political power and the identity therein is transformed in, into, I'm a genocide scholar, into an exclusionary ideology where people are being targeted for extermination, then the political establishment needs to be usurped. Right, then all of social mobilization has to be directed to getting those people out of power. But if, but if the political power and the political structure is mobilized for addressing the needs of mar uh, marginalized populations, recognizing realistically that it cannot simultaneously address all needs, and thus it addresses the needs of those communities that are most effectively mobilized, why is that a bad thing? I don't, I mean, if it's a bad thing, tell me why it's a bad thing. Make a video response, you know, you know, tell me it's a bad thing, right? But, I mean, I don't, I don't see why that's a bad thing. I don't see why um, many, many, many liberal uh, academics uh, see themselves as almost inherently anti-state, right? They take this sort of anti-bureaucracy, um, right? They're, they, it doesn't have to necessarily be anarchy, right? And I don't, I'm not trying to go through the whole distinctions. As I said, that's irrelevant to my, dis my discussion, my discussion presupposes all of that, right? My discussion is a more foundational discussion because it's a conceptual, ideological discussion. And the idea is, why is it a problem for an individual to want to defend a mechanism that affords individual more, uh, marginalized 
people, marginalized individuals, recognition. Right? The attempt to usurp political power as such, then, seems to create a condition where it's even more difficult for marginalized populations to gain any recognition. Right? So the fact that you do away with political power and political establishment as such, right? there's too much power, there's too much centralization as such. Granted, I agree, that can be problematic in certain states. Right? And again, I'm not talking about specifics. It doesn't have to necessarily be socialist or communist. Just in certain states of affairs, you know, that's a problem. But what we have to recognize is that we can't make this blanket statement for all aspects of political power. We have to be far more specific in our analysis and that this is what I'm cautioning. So last sentence for the first part, and I'm actually gonna pause and make two parts of this video to check that I make sure I have battery. I'm probably have to delete some previous videos. Um, the political becomes more just, right? So let me just read those last two sentences again and then I'll pause and there'll be a part two. So thus the relation between, this is page four, thus the relation between the governing ideology and the respective identities of individuals within marginalized communities serves as a necessary condition for the identity reformation of the political, for all the reasons that I just said. The political then becomes more just in the best state of affairs, right? Political becomes more just because insofar as there has been effective social mobilization from mar marginalized communities, it increases the effectiveness of social mobilization from marginalized communities increases the likelihood of recognition from hegemonized power, which facilitates both groups. Hegemonized power maintains power. Since civil rights, the United States of America is still the United States of America. It's not something different. So power has been maintained and individual blacks and the black community, I hate the term, but you know, African Americans um, and uh, the African American community and African Americans have been empowered. Both have benefited. Thus, the argument is why not select those ideological conceptual mechanisms that benefit both communities and not jump on the bandwagon, um, new and upcoming scholars, and say, oh, it's the political problem. It's the political problem. Let's do away with the political. Because my argument is you're shooting yourself in the foot. And you really don't know what you're talking about. And to be honest with you, I'm getting a little tired of all the sloppy academics, right? So, you know, I'm not going to go crazy here. <laughs> I'm not going to go crazy here. But, you know, let's know what we're talking about before we start talking about it. So I'm going to pause the video, come back, and pick up with, the, uh, with part two of the discussion.